All right, Dante, take it away. Don't forget to unmute yourself. All right, we're working through this, you know, first hopefully of not too, too many digital versions of the Naira release. But uh, anyway, I'm Dante Furioso and I'm the managing editor of the New York Review of Architecture. Uh, and I'm speaking to you from my apartment in New York. Uh, the church bells have just finished ringing and I've done something that I've done every evening at 7 p.m. for, I don't know, a week, two weeks, three weeks. It's hard to tell at this point. Um, I've stepped out onto my fire escape and yelled and clapped uh, and pretended that my fire escape doesn't feel like a cage. But anyway, it's about all we've got these days. Uh, and it does feel good to say hi to neighbors uh, that I've never met before. Um, on that note, if you haven't said hi to someone on the chat uh, that you don't know, why don't you go ahead and try, you know, using the private chat feature, saying hi to someone. It's so good to see everyone introducing themselves. And thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. Um, so first of all, I wanted to get, just give some shout outs. Um, first of all, shout out to uh, our editors, Julie Turgeon, James Coleman, and Sarah Casper. Uh, Julie's been doing an amazing job with our Instagram and social media. James is helping us to not completely fumble our way into the world of live streaming. Um, and Sarah has actually managed to procure real honest to God hand drawings, even in a time of Zoom and social distancing. Um, also, I'd like to thank our graphic designers, um, Chase Booker and Laura Foxgrover, who have once, once again done a beautiful job uh, producing this issue. I'd also like to give a special shout out to Zazu Swistel, who is our new uh, Skyline editor, uh, who managed to turn a bunch of canceled events into an entire column. Um, and last, but certainly not least, um, special thanks to our publisher, Nicholas Kemper and his wife, Molly, uh, without whom this publication simply would not exist. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to be launching our 10th issue. But first I'd like to tell you a little bit about our normal distribution events. Normally we actually get together in a real space over beers and a meal, usually pizza, or dumplings and we produce the physical broadsheet. We stuff literally 300, 400, 500 copies uh, printed on real paper and we drop them in a real blue metal mailbox to be delivered by the USPS. Um, and also as part of that launch event, we normally ask architects and designers to review a New York City building. Um, this month, we're asking them to review their homes, but more, a bit, more on that in a bit. First, I'd like to say a few more words about our publication and issue 10. So at the review, we're attempting to foster a community of designers and architects that care deeply about the built environment, to bear witness to the times we're living in, to take positions, to debate, and to hopefully push for the things that we believe in. In a city as large and fragmented as New York, our publication takes the events, buildings, exhibitions, talks, and the gossip and puts it on one sheet, published monthly and mailed to you. Although this month we had a little bit of a problem, it seems that some of the events were canceled, um, which kind of brings us to the elephant in the room, uh, which is that we're, we're not living in normal times. And if anything, the times we're living in show us how much the built environment is inextricably linked to public health. Shortages of hospital beds, cramped housing, cramped streets, Clearly architecture matters. And while it alone will not solve social, economic, and political problems in these unusual times, we should continue to engage with the important issues related to the built environment. We put out a call for pandemic coverage and our co correspondents answered with a variety of topics. So I'll go through some of those. First of all, there are some historical precedents for the built environment's relationship to public health crises. And in his article about open air schools as a response to tuberculosis, Hassan Hakim argues that architecture has always been bound up with public health. Stephanie Jasmine, Jasmines and Bobby Canavino are back, reflecting on the very, very dimensional aspects of social distance. And Gideon Fink Shapiro responded by recalling architecture, the way architecture served as a backdrop for the plague in Thomas Mann's Death in Venice. Architecture is also the backdrop for a more lively activity in Kaviyashri Charala's essay on Orchard Beach in the Bronx, which is currently being renovated. 
not sure if it'll be open in time for this summer, uh, I guess if we have a summer. And speaking of another kind of renovation, Nicholas Rapp visits an early 20th century industrial building that was converted into a hospital to reflect on the relationship between architecture and healthcare. Eduardo Alfonso takes on the recent residential building boom in Manhattan, arguing, arguing that it's done little to improve the domestic architecture that we find ourselves kind of trapped in these days. What do architects and developers actually care about? Well, at least one architect wants us to live in a building made from giant glass barrels. And Mark Talbot has identified a new typology, the bay window writ large, in his review of the new Heatherwick Lantern Building. In another way of asking what have we been doing, Kyle Dugdale argues that bad history underpins much of our recent debate about style in his article, While the City Burns. But that's not the only debate our correspondents take on. Elisa Iturbe takes on the post. No, not the male, but the post-Anthropocene, the post-carbon, arguing that these terms obscure the fact that pollution and humanity's effect on our environment are far from over. And if you're stuck in your room, fear not, you can read about other people's rooms in Wes Hyatt's review of Dogma's book, The Room of One's Own. And while you're quarantining, we even have our first Netflix review of Unorthodox, with a shout out to Baller Steel, the eccentric style of Berlin's own Henrik and Doris Baller that serves as, the, as a backdrop for scenes in that recent TV series. Finally, we're excited that one of our canceled events was actually turned into an interview. Our correspondent, Alyssa Lopez Serfozzo, interviewed Mexican architect Tatiana Bilbao, and they discussed the pandemic, domestic architecture, and women's rights. And so thank you to all of our contributors who helped make this issue happen under obviously less than ideal circumstances. Before I turn it over to our master of ceremonies, Madeline Ringo, I'd like to say a word about our subscribers. I can't emphasize how important you guys are to, for us. The, your money literally pays our writers. And sure, no one's really getting rich off of this. No one gets rich off of it. Well, some people get rich off of it, but most people don't get rich off of architecture. Um, we do pride ourselves in paying everyone who writes or makes a drawing for us. Everyone gets paid something. And that's kind of a cornerstone of, our, of the ethos of our publication. And that really can't happen without um, without our subscribers. So I'd like to encourage any of you who have not already subscribed, go to, go to naira.nyc and, uh, and subscribe tonight. Also, if you'd just like to sign up for our mailing list, we'll send you um, a digital copy of the issue tonight. Because um, for this particular issue, we're not, we're not printing it like normal, it's just gonna be um, sent out as a PDF, but we will print it and send it to you in the mail at a later date. So for this month, Instead of doing our normal, our normal New York Reviews architecture, we've teamed up uh, with Madeline Ringo of Dinner with Designers. Um, since we normally review buildings for the distribution event, we thought it would make sense to ar ask architects to review their own homes this month. From Kentucky, Madeline Ringo lives in Brooklyn and is a senior designer at Glossier. In 2017, she began organizing Dinner with Designers, a dinner party series that brings together a small group of guests to have dinner and conversation with an influential designer in their home. The dinners explore the role of domestic space in relationship to design practice and thinking, but also offer a more intimate setting away from the lecture hall for young designers to engage with well-known practitioners uh, of many stripes. Madeline will introduce our presenters for the night. And thank you so much. I'm turning it over to Madeline. Uh, it's super great to see you all. I just want to remind you that you can, when we're not on screen share, you can click um, the, the gallery view at the top right corner and you can see all of these amazing people that have joined this meeting. Um, so yeah, my name is Madeline Ringo. I live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I started Dinner with Designers shortly after leaving Yale, um, Yale's MARC program, because I was really missing that mentoring relationship that you often have with your professors and your teachers. So I kind of thought, why not convince them all to throw par dinner parties for us instead? And that's where it started and we're still doing it. So I wanted to um, quickly share with you some information about that. Um, let me grab here. 
So we have an Instagram. You can find us at Dinner with Designers. Um, these are the types of things that we do. We cook hot pot on a table with 15 people. Um, we get to go inside their homes and understand uh, the different objects in their house and why it's important to them and how their sort of approach to design also influences the way that they live. Um, someday we will have a website. Hopefully the quarantine will allow me to, to finish it up. Um, but yeah, we'd love, we'd love to see you at the next event and um, we'll post them. We, we're not going to do any virtual dinners because we, you know, we thought that having them in the home is really the most important part. So we're going to hold off until, until we were back to normal. So I would like to introduce um, two incredible people who have certainly had a lot of influence on my life, the way I think about architecture and design, and they've opened my eyes to many more exciting ways to approach architecture um, and drawing in specific. So live from New York, we will have Mark Foster Gage. Mark is the principal of Mark Foster Gage Architects and a professor at Yale since both since 2001. Sam Jacob, Sam Jacob lives in London. So live from London, it's quite late for him. Um, Sam makes architecture, writes about architecture, teaches architecture, makes projects about architecture and sells products about architecture. <laughs> So um, I'd like to thank you guys both for um, rallying up yourselves to jump on this idea at the last second. Um, and I think I would like to go ahead and introduce Mark Gage to the audience. Um, and Mark, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. And uh, Mark is gonna share his screen, give a presentation and, and review his home. All right. Are unmuted by host. Can you hear me, Madeline? Yeah, so you guys can hear me. Okay, good. Um, Thank you uh, for giving me some, you know, reason to take a shower today uh, and put on a clean shirt. It's always nice to have an excuse to do, do something like that. It's amazing how our idea of what's exciting has changed in the last couple of weeks, that a shower and a shirt is enough to do it for me these days. Uh, as Madeline mentioned, I was asked to give a kind of review of my apartment and what that means is really kind of up in the air at the moment. Um, and I think Sam and I are maybe gonna tackle it in some kind of different ways, but I'm gonna first share my screen with you here and bring up a little folder. All right, uh, can you guys see that? I'm gonna, Madeline, you're gonna be my um Yes, cute, so. we can see it, Mark. Okay, you can see it, great. All right, so I, like most of you, probably have been watching way too much news. Um, but one thing I found really interesting about watching all of this news is that because everyone's reporting live from their houses, you get to see in all these people's different apartments, all these kind of famous newscasters and policymakers and doctors. And I just find it really interesting to look a little bit into people's lives and see the kind of things you know, like this guy in the lower left, who I think is some really important doctor with his unused Peloton in the background. It's just an interesting glimpse that you don't normally get into people's lives. So I've decided to give you that glimpse, although I put away my Peloton, uh, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to see it. It's just covered with dry, no, I don't really have a Peloton. I was talking with Madeline earlier that hu humor doesn't really work over Zoom because you can't hear people laughing back, but I'm gonna give it my best shot anyways. Uh, and pretend we're, we're laughing, Mark. It's you're good. laughing inside, right? But you know, when you make a joke and you don't hear anything, it's always like, uh, anyways, um, I've decided to give you a little glimpse into my life and how my apartment is, I guess, really holding all of that, but how it maybe my apartment reveals a little bit about me. I know that a lot of the people who 
subscribe to the New York Review of Architecture and do dinner with designers, which I've hosted, um, are younger. And I think it's interesting to show people how, you know, how architects live. Um, so this first image was just of a bunch of different people, but I'm gonna give a little context of my apartment. I live in Manhattan. The yellow dot is where I live. I live right by Washington Square Park. Uh, on the right, you can see a little hand-drawn map of Mercer Street. I live at 300 Mercer Street. And Mercer Street is, just to give you a little history, uh, <clears throat> a Mercer is someone who sells clothing and textiles. Uh, the Singer Building with the sewing machine company is on Mercer Street, several blocks south of me. But Mercer wasn't actually named for uh, Mercers who sell cloth, even though the region, the area here, is was historically about garments and making uh, manufacturing clothing. Uh, it was actually named after Hugh Mercer, who was one of George Washington's generals, who convinced George Washington to march on Princeton. And as a Yale professor for 20 years, I think marching on Princeton is a really important thing historically, so I thought I would bring that up. See, no laughter. The, <laughs> the building I live in is, uh, it's called the Hillary Gardens, which my boyfriend and I thought was really great when we thought our president was gonna be named Hillary, but now we're a little bit saddened by it every time we come home. But uh, it's my strategy has always been to live in the ugliest building on the block so you don't have to look at it. And that strategy rings true. I stole an image from Getty Images here on the upper left and you can see my building in the, uh, the center. Uh, of looking down Astor Place. So this is looking down the non-Mercer side. And How often do you use the pool? Yeah, the, we have a pool on the roof, which is one of the great redeeming aspects of it. And it's a really great feature to have because it's so rare to have in New York City. Obviously it's closed right now, but uh, it's so amazing. It's on the 35th floor. So you're just swimming, looking out at probably, you know, just a bunch of architecture. Um, and then the lower right view is the view of our apartment, like what we face. And I thought I'd just give a little bit of history about that. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Yeah, okay. So the little brown building at the end of the street is the Cooper Union where President Lincoln gave an address in 1860 where he brought up the possibility that the federal government might take control of slavery. So historically, this building is one of the most important in terms of Lincoln's career because it really got him a lot of momentum politically. And it was the first time anyone had really brought up the possibility of the federal government seriously taking on the issue of slavery. The rest of the area was owned by John Jacob Astor, which is why it's called Astor Place. And most of the buildings uh, here where my cursor is were built between about 1850 and 1890. This right here was the site of the Astor Place Opera which was the most significant opera house in New York City for quite a few years. And then the new entry here, which is this glass building, was by Charles Guathme, who is a pretty well-known architect here in the city, a Yale graduate who died a number of years ago. But there was a proposal previously that was a team proposal by Rem Koolhaas and Herzog Nimron, which was actually pretty interesting. I suggest some of you young architects go take a look at it. So when I was asked to start doing this, Madeline asked if I could draw my apartment from memory. So I sat down and tried to do it. And here's the result of that attempt. It's a two bedroom, two bathroom apartment. Um, and I live here with my boyfriend and two dogs who I'll show you some images in a minute. But as this was a review, I thought I would actually, you know, try to analyze my apartment. And I found a lot of golden sections and the programmatic analysis reveals that there's an outdoor space, a no architecture zone, and an architecture zone, which I will probably talk a little bit about. And I think it's interesting because Sam and I, the person who's gonna be re reviewing his place next, have kind of different attitudes about how we combine work and life, which I think is an interesting subject since we're all stuck here. So this is an image of my office where I keep all of my architecture life, all of my books, all my employees, all of our computers, our shop, everything is in the office, which frees up my apartment to be a kind of no architecture zone. So I don't have a lot of, I don't like coffee table books about architecture. 
I really loathe the idea of coming home and seeing my own work hung up on the walls, which I see a lot in architects' apartments. I don't collect architects' drawings. I don't buy old architecture prints. I like my apartment to be completely architecture free because as some of you may know, I also teach and write. And I like having my apartment be a kind of refuge from design and work. I like it to be a place that's really all about, uh, you know, not only relaxing and watching TV, but reading and thinking. And it gives me a kind of sp free space to do that. So this is what you see when you walk into our apartment. You see my dog Truman here laying on the ground, uh, who I'll introduce you to in a moment. But you'll see no bookcases because I keep all of that stuff at the office. And here you get a glimpse into our bedroom. On the left, there's a little corridor that leads to another bedroom, which we use as an office, second bathroom, and a kitchen. And most of these I'll show you through the course of this little tour. So Madeline also asked me to show who I'm in quarantine with. This is my boyfriend, Jaron, on the left, who's a psychotherapist, and my two dogs, Gizmo and uh, Truman, on the right. I just thought I'd show this image on the left because it's how we're eating every night, you know, racks of lamb and no, this is our and Christmas. And you've got your Christmas tree up. Yes, I know. <laughs> this is our Christmas dinner. I thought I'd show, you know, what I wish we were eating these days, but actually it's pretty sad fare of delivery and, you know, canned soups and stuff. Uh, but I wanted to talk about a couple of objects. The Madeline had brought up the possibility of focusing on a couple of objects that maybe re reveal a little bit about ourselves and our apartments. So I wanted to show a couple of the pieces of art that I've been collecting over the years. The first is one that you see when you walk in um, on the immediate right, and it's above this table. It's a, it's a piece by Jason Martin, who is from the Young British Artists Group in the 1990s, from the, a very famous show called The Sensation Exhibit, um, which kind of toured the world. He was brought up in the same litter of artists as Damien Hirst and Chris O'Feely. And what he does is he paints with uh, combs and different materials. So, um, and this piece was actually titled Tribute to Eve Klein because Eve, Eve Klein was one of the first artists to use this synthetic blue called ultramarine blue, which is this really intense blue. And the Eve Klein estate actually uh, sued Jason Martin to not use that name. So now this piece is titled, Untitled Ultramarine Blue. And I wanted to use it as an example to talk about an idea from aesthetics. I write a lot about aesthetic theory. I've done, I've done three books in the last couple of years. Two, one of them was a monograph on my office and two of them were about aesthetics. And I'm just gonna give you one idea about aesthetics here because I think it might be interesting as we all think about our apartments. But there's these three distances in aesthetics. Um, this is a close up of the painting, but I'm gonna use these little cows to talk about it. The, these little cows are uh, some little bulls I got in Tibet. Last semester, I taught a, an advanced design studio at Yale with a philosopher named Graham Harmon, who's um, pretty well known in the philosophy world, probably not so much in the popular world. But we took our students to Tibet for about a week and a half and specifically to look at places that prompt contemplation. So we were looking at the history of Buddhist monasteries, driving around the Tibetan countryside with our 10 students in our church bus, um, stopping off at these remote Buddhist monasteries. And I picked up this collection of cows over the course of three weeks, but I'm gonna use them to illustrate this idea of distances. Um, in aesthetics, you have three distances. One is the distance that you have to the aesthetic qualities of an object. So if I see this cow, I can see that it's brass, I understand that it has a certain weight. I know that it's metal. That's one aesthetic distance is what your senses give to you. Another distance is to the things about these cows that you could know, but don't. So I don't know the exact chemical composition of these cows. I don't really know their exact weight in grams. I don't know the different metals and alloys that went into their manufacture, uh, but I could find these things out. I could go to a laboratory and find these things out. So that's the second aesthetic distance. And the third is the things that these objects hold within themselves that you could never know. So the one example I give is that these are made of iron. Iron is an element. 
heavier than hydrogen and helium. All elements heavier than hydrogen and helium are only made in the supernova of dying stars. So these little cows are comprised of atoms that were the result of a supernova sometime between 4 billion years ago when the Earth was formed and 13 billion years ago when the universe was formed. So these cows all of a sudden take on this kind of more interesting mysterious quality in that they have these distances. And one of the things I wanted to talk about is how when we're limited in what we can experience in the world, how we can move inward towards objects and the things which we take for granted in our apartments can become far more interesting to us if we kind of become more curious about them in these aesthetic terms. This is also on my current table. I've decided there's no reason we can't be fashionable with our uh, uh, shelter in place. So I made myself a Prada mask, but now I'm actually too embarrassed to walk down the street with it because I feel like such a douchebag that I actually don't use it. So now it's just a little, um, we'll call it an art piece. Uh, this is our living room. And the next thing I wanted to talk about was this painting on the left, which I'm not gonna, oh, sorry. This is our living room. And there's only two locations I operate in in the living room. One is the reading chair and two is the television sofa. In the reading chair, which is kind of facing the window, so I'm not looking at the TV right now, I'm reading Petrarch's uh, Secretum, which is a book he wrote in 1348, which was the first year of the Black Plague. And Petrarch at this time also talks about the value of self-knowledge as opposed to garnering outward fame. So this is a result of thinking about the Black Plague, and he's already in this book talking about the value of going inward. And I just thought it would be good to brush up on this and reread it because it's an interesting book. He's actually really funny. He's a 14th century Italian poet. Um, he talks about everything from going inwards to not bothering to try to impress people that you already despise. He's a really kind of interesting uh, read. And then the other flip side of that is me facing the television, watching Nancy Pelosi, which is kind of like par for the course. She seems to be everywhere these days. But next to that, as you can see off to the left, was this painting, which is done by a much younger artist named Alex Merritt. And he is an artist also that I feel is really trying to get to this, um, I don't know, it seems like he's really struggling with his work. He paints these paintings over the course of years, and he really like kind of hates what he comes up with, and he scrapes all of the paint off to one side. So one side of this painting has this really chunky like band of really heavy, heavy oil painting. This painting is five years old and it still hasn't dried. But you get the sense that he's struggling to get to something that's one of these deeper ideas about aesthetics. And the art that I tend to collect is art that to me is kind of struggling with this. It's not something which is just um, beautiful uh, in its appearance. It seems to be inviting us to be more curious about some deeper level. And that's also how I think about my work in architecture. So my ideas about aesthetics, the way I think about art, and the way I think about my work are all kind of related and all encapsulated in these number of pieces. Um, it's very nice to have a balcony here. We've decided, my boyfriend and I, if things go too south, that we can just make a garden and you know raise squashes and we can just live on our own because we have all this fabulous outdoor space. Uh, my my uncle is a farmer and I'm from Nebraska. So I, I, I feel that I probably have these farming skills genetically with inside me, although I've never done it. Mark, can I ask you a question about your terrace? This is from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, Petra has asked, in this time of isolation, are you finding yourself utilizing your outdoor space more than you did prior to COVID-19? Yeah, you know, it's funny what we use it most for. And first of all, I've known Petra for 25 years. She had a crush on me in college. And since she's muted, she can't fight back when I say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know what we use it for, as Dante just mentioned, uh, every night at seven o'clock, all New Yorkers go out and clap in support of the health workers. My boyfriend and I take big pots and pans out and bang on them. But yes, absolutely. I go out on the, uh, uh, especially now it was 70 degrees in New York. I go out there all the time. It's a nice little 
escape from you know this like isolation of of being in home and especially because it has a nice view down Astor Place of these historic buildings, which is a kind of nice thing as well. This is an older picture of my bedroom when it was cleaner. Uh, but uh, basically I'm only showing my bedroom, our bedroom, because at the end of it is our kind of, uh, one of our work in place homes, which Madeline asked us to show. Uh, this is where I normally do all of my writing. So these are all non-architecture books for the most part. And I tend to bring home any of the books about things I'm writing about. And I do all my writing here at this table. I do all my designing at the office, reading in the other room, writing here. I'm very like maybe OCD about it, but it also has a kind of nice view um, down the do you think Do you think the buildings in your view ever, ever sway your writing? Well, that's a good question. I hadn't thought about that. Um, I'd have to get back to you on that. Worth considering. Uh, uh, one of the objects here is this big panda, which I'll show you an image of in, in, in a minute. But I basically, this is where I am right now with these books behind me. I've turned our bedroom into my Zoom studio because I spend a lot of time on Zoom with um, clients and students, as I'm sure a lot of you are. And I have a very subtle product placement here for our monograph. Um, so I'm sure you're all going to rush out and buy that. So I can make all the money that Dante uh, was talking about that architects make through publication. Um, that little uh, uh, panda, I just wanted to give a little shout out to because it's a, a company that I own a very small part of, but I've also done a lot of design for. It's called Nico Panda. It's a fashion line. Lady Gaga wears a lot of it. This is her wearing some of our, the, my office does all the product design for them. So we designed those sunglasses. We designed a range of products for MAC Cosmetics that was sold globally. So we designed all these. And here's that little panda in a store in Beijing. Uh, this is the one in my bedroom. But we also took that little panda to the Great Wall of China for a photo shoot. And here you can see in the reflection of the panda, the Great Wall of China. We're literally on top of the Great Wall of China. So this little panda here in my little mini office has literally been around the world with me. Um, I keep little, a couple keeps, keepsakes in this area. This is a 3D print that went bad because it all this, got all this patching. This is a 3D print in solid copper. Um, and it was for this project for a resort in the desert. Um, I can't talk about the location, but this is the main entrance of the reception area. So in a lot of our work, it tends to be pretty intricate and you can't make something like this out of cardboard and foam core. So a lot of times we're 3D printing, oftentimes in metal for presentations to the client. And you just can't throw something like that away. And then this is our other room, our kind of junk room, where my boyfriend, who's a therapist, has set up his virtual Zoom station. And on the background here, you can see my 1982 Diamondback Silver Streak, which was the first thing I ever bought with my own money. And I just cannot bring myself to get rid of it. So it's with me in every apartment. And if you live in New York, you know that you have no room for a dirt bike. And I'm way too fat and heavy to ride it right now. So it's a completely useless object. You, know, you can only ride these things when you weigh 100 pounds or so, but an important object to me nonetheless. Uh, and the last image I'm going to show, or the last object I'm going to show is of these art objects we're doing for an exhibition. We're casting them in our office. And I've decided to use this time uh, to teach myself how to airbrush paint, which is something I've always wanted to do. And so some of these are cast in their native plastics, but some of them I'm airbrushing. So these are each about a foot and a half tall and in a series of seven different types. This is one type shown in three different colors. But I've turned our second bathroom into an airbrush uh, studio and brought all my equipment from the office. So I spend time in here practicing how to airbrush and testing out different colors and coatings and materials on these different art objects. So I kind of figured in quarantine for a couple of weeks, I might as well pick up on a skill. There's no way I'm smart enough to learn a language I've tried. I lived in Rome for a year, didn't pick up a lick of Italian. I have no talent for music. So I thought uh, airbrush painting was the one thing I could probably wrap my head around. What uh, an incredible, um attempt or ambition that was. Yeah, it's not looking so great right not here. Not toxic or anything for your home. 
Yeah, it, you know what's great is that this bathroom has a view out to another building, which is very close. So you get these huge amounts of wind. So they just suck all this poisonous fumes out and they go to Brooklyn. So it's great. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've been, these are all like the paints. My boyfriend also collects fragrances. So he has a pretty impressive, he got a certificate in fragrance design just as a hobby from Pratt. And these are all of his fragrances, which is actually probably a bad idea because I'm, I'm dealing with like a really heavy compressor here that makes sparks and noise. So these could all very easily go up in flame. But I'm sure I'm violating every OSHA health guideline here, but it's just me, so I don't really mind. But I spend a lot of time in this little bathroom learning uh, the fine art of spray brushing. And I completely suck right now, but I anticipate possibly sometime in the future getting better. And the last slide here is just the final view of our apartment. I box two to three days a week as a way to stay fit. And I always hang my boxing gloves on the entrance to the kitchen. So every time I go to the kitchen to eat something, I'm forced to see these boxing gloves and remind myself of the need to go get some exercise and box. But uh, they're just sitting there. I obviously haven't been able to box, um, but I did get an email from the trainers and coaches at my gym that they were offering private boxing sessions on Zoom for $200 an hour. So I could literally like put on my, <laughs> so I thought that was actually a business I might take up. It seems like a real no brainer as a way to make money, you know, just let people punch you on a webcam for two for an hour for 200 bucks a pop, no pun intended. Um, but anyways, this is the final image and I will turn it over again to our moderator Madeline, and I think uh, yeah. Sam is going to present his apartment, then we're going to have Q&A. Is that right? Yes. Thank you, Mark. You can stop okay. sharing your screen now, but don't unmute yourself. I have, um, okay. I have a couple of follow-up questions. So you talked, a lot, you talked about how you, don't, um, you really leave your home as this place where you don't have your architecture, you, know, you don't have your office things, so it is this kind of place for you to escape. But it really seems like Although you don't have like literal architectural work there, it seems like all of all of the ideas that really influence the way that you think about architecture are there through the form of objects or paintings or um, these other types of non-architecture books that are influencing sort of your mind, almost as if like yeah. while you're home, you're sort of absorbing all of those ideas and then you go to the office and that's where you sort of execute. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you bring that up. I just had a class this morning. I'm teaching a class called Creativity, Innovation, and the New. And it's not about how to be creative. It's about the history of how humans have thought about the idea of creativity. And today we had a guest speaker on Zoom with my class, which is spread out around the world. And it was Cecilia Dean, who is the founder of Visionaire Magazine, which is one of the most important art and fashion and media magazines for probably the last 20 or 30 years. But we were talking just about that, how inspiration oftentimes doesn't come from like, you know, the exotic trips to Morocco. It's so easy to be inspired, she said, by an exotic trip to Morocco. But it's actually much more exciting to be inspired by maybe even everyday things or things that you take for granted, the things that are already around you, which is why I'd like to offer to the audience the possibility that this quarantine is a chance to go inward into things that you wouldn't normally consider. And in that way, it's a reflection of uh, Proust. This is gonna sound really douchey when you drop Proust into a, uh, a talk, but he said the real uh, voyage in life comes in uh, uh, not in visiting new landscapes, but in having new eyes, you know? And this offers us all an opportunity to have new eyes. Right. I'm curious if um, all of our residential architects out in the world are going to come back with a thousand new ideas of how, how to design domestic space. Yeah, uh, they're all probably going to design separate rooms for every like husband and wife or partnership. <laughs> I know a right. lot of people are getting on each other's nerves. Right. Um, we also have another question from the audience. Uh, from Gideon, um, he said, the boxing gloves in the home, is this a tribute to Le Corbusier? <laughs> I don't know, did Le Corbusier box? I have no idea. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, okay, well, I, I'd love to start out uh, start up with Sam, that way we can yeah. kind of 
do some cross conversation afterwards. But thank you so much for showing us your home and all of your private spaces and, and all of your projects. Yeah. All right, Sam, um, if I'll re actually, you know, let me reintroduce both Mark and Sam because um, a couple people joined later. There's actually, we now have uh, 154 participants. So this is, this is incredible. Don't forget to click your gallery view and flip through all of these amazing faces. Um, but yeah, just for everyone who came a little bit later, uh, I just want to reintroduce. So we just heard from Mark, who is the principal of Mark Foster Gage Architects and a professor at Yale, both since 2001. And next up, we are going to hear from Sam Jacob, live from London. Sam makes architecture, writes about architecture, teaches architecture, makes projects about architecture, and sells products about architecture. Sam, are you with us? Don't forget to unmute yes, yourself. I am. Oh, yes, okay. finally, I can unmute myself. All right. You kept me locked down <laughs> sonically. <laughs> um, and uh, what time is it there? It's late. It's late. It's like, uh, um, uh, like quarter to one. Oh. Um, in the morning. Um, but like, what time is it anywhere? Like, all of these things are different, right? Like, uh, like, yeah, domestic space is different. The city is different. Time is also different. Um, I'd like to offer up a novel. My novel of quarantine times and domesticity is what, one of my favorite books, actually, which is um, uh, Against Nature, Arabor, um, by Huysmans which is a novel that's sort of set in like, I guess like, I guess written in the early 20th century, I think. And it's about a guy who is so disgusted. He's the last of a line of aristocrats and he's so disgusted with the world that he kind of retreats into his house outside of Paris. And every chapter is like him kind of retreating further from the world. Um, and every chapter he tries to kind of like, kind of, um, like really perfect his lifestyle. So there, there's a chapter on food um, where he, you know, goes through all kinds of recipes. And in the end, he tries, he, he sort of invents a sort of what he thinks is the essence of food. And that's what he, that's what he lives on. He does the same with literature, the same with music. He does the same in an amazing chapter with interior design where he's like, starts off trying to choose colors and eventually gets to this point where he gilds a giant, um, a tortoise and then puts jewels into the shell of the tortoise and that in some senses maybe that's the kind of thing which is happening to all of us in perhaps a slightly less extreme way just looking at everyone's Instagram feeds and the incredible uh, reorganization of bookshelves and the cleaning of bathroom tiles which haven't been cleaned for probably far too long is this sort of magnification of the domestic space which we're which we're in. Um, but I'm going to show you around my place, which is a little bit different, actually. It's, it's almost exactly the opposite of, of Mark's. Let me um, share my screen. Yeah. Okay. Oops. So, uh, yeah, I am in London. And I, the place where I live is also the place where I work. And so it's also an office which means it's both pr a private space but it's also where you know um my employees come clients come uh so it's kind of very mixed up in theory it's sort of split like ground floor is the office and upstairs is the is the apartment but there's no wall you know the staircase is open the bathroom there's one bathroom it's used by both spaces so there's a kind of bleeding of the two spaces between each other all the time which is a little bit kind of weird and a little bit uncomfortable and i think for everybody involved like probably more for, especially for my poor employees who have to kind of i don't know they kind of see me in my dressing gown no, no that does not happen <laughs> but it, what it means is i have to get i have to make sure i get up early i can't have a i can't have a lie in and then like you know pretend i you know had a meeting or something like that because uh that will be far too obvious so um so i i loved the prompt uh madeline of, of of making a drawing for memory and this is sort of 
my smeary life of pub public and private work and leisure and family and yeah, you know, uh, whatever, whatever the opposite of family is. Um, uh, you can't, probably can't quite tell which is upstairs, which is downstairs. Mm. And quite frankly, now you can't really tell which is which. I'm here with my daughter. She's 16. Um, uh, and so, yeah, you'll see a bit about like how things are kind of over overlapping. Um, this is the outside of where I am. So it's in a re pretty residential district. Um, it's kind of behind this white building here, through this little archway. And through that archway, you come into a kind of yard. And though it's a residential district, this is a Victorian school building, um, just on the right hand side. And on the left hand side, an old factory, which is now being converted into some residential stuff. And then I'm in this super weird, like building, built in the 1980s, which is supposed to be a kind of garage for your car downstairs and little apartment above. Um, I'm not really supposed to use this bit of concrete, but of course, I'm always using it, especially now, <laughs> this is where I go and sit outside where I'm growing plants. But it's also where, like, you know, we use, we, the office uses it for all kinds of things that we're doing or making or things which are happening in, in projects. We often get complaints from the the people in the flats uh, that look down on it, like, what the hell are you doing this time? Um, so, you know, we're making like bits of ruined column. This is actually a, a thing we've been doing the last couple of days, uh, tie-dyeing um, some half-timbered t-shirts. Uh, uh, first experiments in tie-dyeing, but they, yeah, yeah. That's your quarantine activity. One of them, one of them, one of them. So this is inside, this is in the ground floor, looking sort of through the office, back out into the a sort of conservatory, which looks out into a garden, which is not our garden, but we get a very nice view of nature and we get kind of uh, uh, you know, a really nice light down at that end. Two banks of desks, either side, computers, uh, some, you know, some of which have now dispersed around London with their employees. Um, shelves with loads of crap on them in uh, kind of more working times. This was, this was uh, Eddie, one of my employees, pretending to work while being filmed for something or other. Um, and you can see, yeah, the shelves just kind of build up of bits of model, books, uh, files, um, some things which have got a lot to do with architecture some things which haven't so in a way the sort of domestic or you could say the non-architectural bleeds into the architectural world but that's also perhaps to do with like my attitude towards architecture which is to sort of let's say mix up what might be canonical or what might be disciplinary with things which are usually considered to be outside of it this is my daughter's uh, uh oil painting studio which she's assembled uh, where there's usually a workstation. So she's working hard uh, on some paintings in her Easter holidays. Um, and it's full of like sort of things which are not quite projects, not quite architecture. This is a, a Corinthian column lampshade. Uh, this is a, a kind of LED grow light. Um, these are acanthus plants in um, uh, kind of hanging uh, plant pots, upside down plant pots. So they're kind of, you know, like a Corinthian capital without the column below it. This is a lampshade, which is um, the dome of um, the Pantheon, kind of uh, like kind of evacuated from the Pantheon and turned into a domestic object. Um, and this is right the, at the back of the office where you can see some of the stuff which I've been growing, which I've, I had a march on, um, quarantine by growing these chilies but here's some experiments in um kind of paint paint scraping on mirror dichroic samples um some more kind of tropical plants growing up there those are your those are your paintings or was that your daughter's this oh this is mine <laughs> no she's a lot better than me <laughs> this was like me doing my Best slash worst Gerhard Richter. <laughs> yeah, not so, not so good. So this is a little bit of upstairs. Um, it doesn't look that different in a way. Same sort of arrangement. Plants on the 
windowsill. Um, you can see there's like food stashed everywhere at the moment. There's a vegetable box, some delivery, um, uh, table TV, like more lamp, look kind of like w sort of almost lampshades, a sample of a project which broke, which I thought looked amazing. So I framed it and hung it on the wall. Um, uh, there you go, yeah. Uh, kind of things lying around a Philippe Stark um, uh, log stool, but that's a, this is a mushroom cloud table that I made a long time ago. Uh, a massive Renzo piano book for some reason. I think I got sent it to review it and then it's too big to get rid of. And I have no sentimental attachment to it whatsoever. I don't think I've ever opened it even. Um, That's a good time. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Time to get into Renzo Piano. Um, Knickknacks on the, so this is a, a souvenir of um, the uh, border between North and South Korea. Uh, a bit of painting that I've been working on. Um, food stashed all over the place. Tins of tomatoes, which I don't know what it's like in, New York City, but they're like gold dust here, like probably second only to toilet paper in, um, in uh, value. <laughs> uh, bits of artwork. So yeah, kind of weird collection. Actually, some of mine, Mark, I, put, I do put some of my own work on the wall. This that's because yours is better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> this pink guy, for example, that's, that's a print of mine. But there's, there's also a lot of other stuff. There's a, um, a Saul Steinberg um, New Yorker cover, uh, which is a sort of amazing drawing of about perspective here's a, a drawing of a piece of plywood by a furniture designer called michael marriott um a, a an original um blueprint from uh mies van der Rohe's office the the a plan of crown hall with the underfloor heating you can see the layout of the underfloor heating on the left hand side worming its way around uh but also this is a, a photo by denise scott brown of Las Vegas in I think the early early ish sixties, um, and this one which was sent to me by David Green of Archigram fame, a photocopy of him holding his old Nokia phone, and it says "Declare a moratorium on building." It was a kind of unsolicited instruction, uh, I think, that he was sending out to everybody that he thought might be attempting to build anything. Um, and then, yeah, various other things which have just kind of come into being, these like road signs which mark places, which of course do not really exist. Arcadia uh, in the kind of heritage brown uh, uh, road sign and Utopia in a highway sign. And then I thought, um, if we've got enough time, I could just show you a few other things, um, like just random things which are around at the moment. I can show you... Uh, this gigantic onion, absolutely <laughs> massive, which came in a vegetable box and I need to find out something to do with it. There's like all kinds of pieces of rock. So there's um, this one, which is from the famous Alison and Peter Smithson building, Robin Hood Gardens, which is being demolished at the moment. Um, but these, um, these little pills here, these are homeopathic pills, which apparently contain a a tiny bit of the Berlin Wall, which if you ingest them, are supposed to somehow unblock you in a psychic way. Um, this flint, which is a Neolithic axe head. Um, but then there's also, you know, the kind of opposite of a Neolithic axe head, like a squidgy, like ice cream uh, kind of, well, I don't even know what it is. It's a squidgy thing. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and building my art collection up, I got this recently. This was like about $20 off eBay. And it claims to be an original Le Corbusier drawing. And it, lit, it, is, a, it is, someone's drawn it. Um, but like, clearly not original. <laughs> um, well, who knows? Who knows? Um, uh, and then of course, surrounded by, you know, kind of, um, like, yeah, kind of weird, weird products, you know, because the, the sort of domestic life and the work life kind of blend. Here's some of the things we work on. This is a scale bar scarf, um, plank tape, entablature tape. So this is, you can decorate your room with a kind of pop classical 
uh, kind of uh, um, uh, uh, effects and then peel it off so you, could, you don't have to sacrifice your deposit to your, to your landlords. Um, uh, what am I doing in quarantine? Well, this is one of the things I've been doing, which is a, uh, it's called World of Interiors. It's a, a globe entirely composed of, of plans, which seems kind of appropriate. Mm -hmm. you are all existing almost all the time in an endless interior. Um, so maybe that, hopefully that gives some kind of flavor of yeah, certainly. Uh, my circumstance right now, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, we we kind of realized this, you know, yesterday when we were speaking. But typically, Mark's home um, is his escape from architecture, and typically, your home is a live work scenario where where your uh, employees are there with you. Uh, but because of this current condition, both of those scenarios have entirely flipped. Mark has had to bring his architecture home and you now no longer can have anyone in your home. So it is now private, whereas Mark's yeah. now architecture. Yeah, and exactly the opposite of, of how it normally is. We've both been feel, screwed. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you guys could talk maybe a little bit about, um, yeah, I guess how how that has made you notice things differently or or what that has brought to your attention uh i mean i guess for one sam you you no longer have the same interactions yeah i really am we're really enjoying that aspect of it yeah <laughs> like you know this 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 setup is not supposed to be forever i'm in the process of of building a house um, but it's a process which has taken, like, you know, like every type of project, but especially architects trying to build their own house, take, it takes forever. Like, and of course, this is the latest reason for a delay. We were absolutely about to start on site. And then, of course, construction sites are closed down. Last time it was the contractor went bust. So we're five years in. So, yeah, it shouldn't, shouldn't really be like this. This is not a dream scenario for me. <laughs> Um, so, so being able to lock everyone else out is actually sweet relief. <laughs> yeah, I mean, from from my end, it's I, I do miss, I miss you know, the people in my office. I kind of miss human camaraderie, you know. And I realize we uh, a lot of you know, just because my office is separate from my apartment, but I think I require both to exist. Uh, you know, it's like I'm only getting half of my normal life. Um, and it was really novel, I think, for the first week. But now I think probably like a lot of people, it's getting a little bit old. And but it, the flip side of that is that, you know, we we're working on a, a couple of projects. And I'm sure like Sam, you know, a lot of our projects have slowed down. One of the things we were working on and that was supposed to come back right about now in fuller force was the museum of lady gaga in las vegas you know and now something like that just seems so un, you know so trivial you know like people are dying around the world how can you work on a museum for lady gaga in las vegas but you know on those vases i probably had covid not happened i probably just would have gone to an auto body shop and hired someone to paint them but it's given me a kind of window of time and opportunity to learn how to do something I always wanted to do. So in that sense, it's been, um, maybe liberating is not the word, but it's given me a pocket of opportunity that I wouldn't normally have in my day-to-day -day life. And I wouldn't have made that pocket in my day-to-day -day life. I would have just been too busy with life and stuff, but this has given you know, it's given me a real moment to struggle with something and permission to be an absolute amateur. You know, I think the older you get, the harder it is to start something new, not necessarily because it's harder to pick it up, but it's just so frustrating because I've been working in architecture for 25 years and I kind of feel like I know what I'm doing, even though some people might definitely argue against that. <laughs> uh, 
but that's why it's so hard to pick up something new because you used to be you're used to being a kind of expert at something and then to go back to square one and be like a total beginner it's really uncomfortable but i'm finding i'm really enjoying that aspect of it that's great and um how long how did both of you sort of come into this particular home that you're in um have you been there for a long time is this you know for instance mark let's maybe start with you um where else did you live in new york or has this always kind of been oh no it's it's funny i i i'm actually my father was in the military so i counted up every apartment and house i've ever lived in and i think it's in the early 20s uh i've moved like 20 25 times and i believe this is the first apartment i've ever had where i painted a wall Hmm. because apartments are always temporary so this is We've been here for about four or five years, I think. But in New York, I've lived on 54th Street. I've lived on Avenue C. I've lived on Rivington, the Lower East Side. I've lived on Suffolk in the Lower East Side. And most recently, I lived on Washington Square North until we moved in here, which is not too far from my old apartment, but maybe like four or five years. And I like this apartment, so I don't really see any reason to, to leave. And I like my office, and it's big now. And... I feel like I'm maybe in a comfortable spot where I'm not yearning for a bigger apartment or yearning for a bigger office. Like I got exactly what I need. I got an apartment I like, I got dogs I like, I got a pool on the roof, I got a car in the garage. Like I don't need anything else. There's nothing that I'm pining for, which is a nice, I mean, that doesn't mean I don't want things or that I'm independently wealthy. It's just I'm content with what I have. Was it something you really wanted to do, paint a wall? (laughs) <laughs> and, and you know what did. like did you go you've did lived you go your whole well life done? when you've lived your whole life in white walls it's not yeah. because i enjoyed the act of painting it's just yeah. i could never paint a wall because i was only going to live there for a year or two yeah, yeah, yeah. and i was just going to have to paint it back yeah so if you saw my apartment there's probably not a wall that isn't painted <laughs> because i went a little nuts <laughs> You could right. like spray them now. You could do like kind of. I could. I know, like airbrushed unicorns yeah. you see on the side of a van. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and like it, after a few months of this, like it's gonna yeah. be like some kind of. Madeline, if we're still here in three months, you gotta have us back. I'll show you the airbrushed <laughs> wizard on the side of my wall. Amazing. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I, sometimes when I'm walking around the streets at night, and you can kind of you can see into people's houses. That sounds creepy, but I noticed that everyone in New York. <laughs> has white walls like everyone lives in a white box and I totally understand that that desire to like I have paints upstairs but I I have this fear that I'm not allowed to paint because I'm gonna have to paint it back or I'm gonna leave in a in a bit yeah you know at one point I was even holding a roll of wallpaper this beautiful like Cynthia Rowley wallpaper and I literally said to myself oh no I'm not quite at that stage in my Mm. life where I can wallpaper Mm. And Sam, what about you? How how did you end up in the in the place that you're at now? Well, it's a, I mean, it is sort of perfect in a way, like parked at this moment where I'm, you know, but wait, wait, waiting to try to get this lasted project finished. Um, so in that sense, it kind of uh, it 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 works out. It works out kind of well in 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 some sense. Um, uh, I've been here probably about five or five or six years now. Um, uh, and, uh, in some senses, I've never really taken it seriously as a project, you could say, like, it's, it's never, it's never, it's never been a project of, of domesticity. Um, uh, it's, that's sort of something which is kind of fitted in to the space. Like I, I have painted the walls, but, um, they, they were breeze block walls. And I, I thought it was like, I thought it'd be really clever to paint them breeze block breeze block gray so that you know like if they're decorated to be the same color that they actually are a kind of like an inauthentic form of authenticity <laughs> or a kind of utilitarian uh, decorative um uh, kind of uh, kind of uh, again quality so that yeah it, it, it is both not what it is but also what it is if that makes sense um so yeah it hasn't had layers of um kind of uh uh what we could, you could say is like typical uh domestification occurring on it and because it's sort of um the space is not really it doesn't feel that domestic um uh 
yeah uh it you know in this circumstance of a kind of live work scenario it's actually actually yeah it's fine it's fine it's fine but the yeah the aim is not to my aim is not to be here forever uh that i would at some point be very happy to move on well let me re let me re i would also like a house <laughs> let me just put that in there <laughs> but in manhattan it's probably a real real long dream <laughs> if, I, if anyone in the audience is like <laughs> offering yeah yeah that's right well yeah. we have a we have a question from r rise Rees. And he is saying, um, this is for Sam. Mm -hmm. Do you ever find yourself in a bind where you might, where your thought process gets affected from living where you work or working where you live, depending on how you view it? Yeah, I, so I think for me, it's like a, it's both like a very negative thing and a, and a very positive thing, actually. Like, um, I do think that, the, you know, like, uh, uh, no, one, no one would ever... I, mean, I, would, I say this sort of some, with some caveats, but like, I would say nobody would ever hire me for a project on account of my professionalism. Now, that's not to say I'm not professional and the office is not professional. We're highly professional and capable of delivering projects. But so, you know, there are so many people who, who are. What we, what we and what I can do is something different, which I think does come from a certain kind of like, you know, uh, kind of... Uh, um, uh, like deliberate ignoring of profession of the sort of professional limitations to say actually no architecture is not about work and then you go home and you do your leisure um for me it's a it's a kind of all consuming or it's you know everything is part of everything else so in that sense yeah there's a, there's often a lot of frustration but i think that sort of general frustration there's also the sort of liberty of like hold on a minute yeah like cooking um you know uh, reading watching tv is part of making work or making ideas about architecture which you know become manifested in projects so i would say for me at least this sort of this sort of smear where you can't quite tell the edge of what is work and what is life um is is in the end really productive and probably is the best best way for someone like me to to work i don't think i would i don't think if you put me in a kind of nine to five um situation i don't think i perform so well mm -hmm. um another question from our guests jc franco uh has asked have either of you had an affinity to other architects personal treatments of their home Mies, eames baragon schindler johnson like this was also a, a an idea that had come about when kind of creating dinner with designers is because it always seems that the architect or the designer in so many different, um, you know, there's those iconic images of the architect in their home. Uh, and I was very curious about how that sort of op how plays into effect in, in contemporary, maybe regular everyday architects, as opposed to just those sort of famous ones that we all know. Um, yeah, so I maybe mean, Mark, I'll, I'll, I'll ask answer. You. I, I... The ones that you mention are, uh, you know, pretty 20th century list. And I think the tendency in the 20th century is for architects to design, obviously modern, modernist, but also a lot of minimalism, even before minimalism was a, an art movement. There was an economy of means that I don't really, I mean, if anyone knows my work, I'm not really known for my economy of means. Um, <laughs> But I just gave a lecture for the Sir, Sir John Soane Foundation. And, you know, John Soane's house in London is like one of the most fabulous architectural environments I've ever seen in my life. And it's, um, you know, filled with art. I mean, just completely chock filled with art and remnants of uh, buildings and not necessarily his projects. Maybe the John Soane Museum is kind of a not so Johnstone House and Museum is kind of a perfect fusion of Sam and my world. My guess would be that he kind of likes it too. But yeah. it's like an overwhelming, if I could afford it to fill my apartment with that much art, I would absolutely do it. I love John, Sir John Stone's house. And I've been to a lot of architects and seen a lot of architects' houses like, you know, Philip Johnson's or the Barragon House in Mexico City. And generally I'm like completely underwhelmed because a lot of the time they just seem to get a lot of their mileage from 
the absence of things like uh, the Farnsworth house or the glass house or the Le Savoie or, and my inclinations run, I would say contrary to that. I also am a huge fan of Lutchens. Um, it's all the British architects who are always great. Right, Sam? <laughs> it's a weird thing. Like, um, there's something about like British, I mean, British, arch British architecture in general, historically speaking, is pretty terrible. You know, like there's, there's not very many great British architects. There's not very 20th, many. 20th century. I don't know, I mean, you know, like compa com compared to like other things that we've, other aspects of culture, we've, you know, we, 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 we're, we're quite good at, you know, books, for example. Music, um, yeah. But architecture we're not so good at, but because as you could also say about Soane, like he's, an, he's amazing at interiors, maybe not so great at like, you know, sort of exteriors in the city. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and in, in his house, Oh my God, like that is a journey into uh, a kind of idea about architecture, into an idea about well, his own story of architecture, um, the bleeding of like his domestic circumstance into his teaching and his office and his, uh, you know, kind of basically his mu museum of architecture is, is un unbelievable. Um, but also the the spatial choreography of it is in, is insane. I yeah I have to say like if if there's ever a building where an architect has expressed their kind of personal like identity belief ideas about themselves and about architecture, I'd say that has to be like the 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 most amazing example. So I mean, yeah, I, should, we, I, should we buy it and move in together? I mean, we both yeah, love I think, it. I think if we got, I think if we got together, Mark, yeah, I yeah, think we, could, I think we could swing it. But like, I never want, I always dis, oh, and the despise. I never wanted to be one of those architects who built their own house. I was like, I want a fucking wanker. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but like, now it turns, now it turns out I'm going to be, oh, I'm trying to become one of those people. Um, yeah. Can you tell us anything about uh, this house that you are building? Can I show? Yeah, I could show you something. Hold on, hold on. Let me like call it up. Uh, 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 uh. And and please, everyone, add your questions in. Keep them coming. So it's. Uh, I just share my screen, right? Like quickly. Yes, you can share your screen. Here, this this thing. Oh wow. So it's like it's it's a it's a house. Well, it's like a, a like a um, an apartment on the top and like a community center on the lower portion. So it's a very it's weird, weirdly complex. So this will be the domestic bit up here. So it will get like one amazing room, and the rest of it pretty like pretty straightforward. So yeah, it's like a kind of I don't know where. Yeah, one really incredible room. That's the sort of ambition for it. And uh, this project, is this something that you're sort of designing um, yourself or is this something you've opened up to your office as well? Is this like a, a collaborative process or has this in, in contrast to your other projects, has this become more private of a design? Uh, it's... Uh, I started working on it um, quite soon after FAT ended and like FAT was a previous office um, that I was part of, which sort of became caricatured for kind of like very rich decoration. And so what I wanted to like kind of do the opposite of that. So it was sort of about like chucking everything out, like trying to, trying to not design anything at all. So it has had a lot of input from people in the office. Um, and a lot of that input is like um, them doing something that I've asked them to do. And then me saying, no, I get rid of it. <laughs> so, but that's a lot of how the office works at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 Uh, we're, we're getting some more questions from the audience. Um, one person has asked Sam, uh, what about what are your thoughts behind the choice of your black and white background? Oh. <laughs> it's it certainly deliberate. It's very deliberate. Um, 
uh, as you guys, as, as, as you know, uh, I spent a lot of time choosing my Zoom backgrounds. Um, thing is, that's the, mainly the, the only architecture which anybody sees these days. <laughs> it's very yeah. important in terms of building a personal brand. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I like the idea of introducing something of the old world of broadcast into, mm. uh, into this. So the, uh, uh, the um, test cards that, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you didn't have it in the US. We, when our TV stations, our TV stations used to stop. We you, like when I was a kid, we only had three stations. Yeah, we had that. You'd get that and, symbol. Yeah. yeah. And it was like this sort of test card, which is like what they use to test the cameras and broadcast and whatever. Are you saying that it's the so. end of the world? Is that your statement about Corona? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, just, I just, I just really like them. <laughs> And there's not much opportunity to to see them now, so I thought I'd just try and resurrect an old a, a, a kind of relic of of uh, video uh, history, but not and, much. Um, another question from Sarah Kim, and Mark, maybe you can start with this. It, she's asking: Has COVID nineteen reshaped your relationship? to materialism in any unexpected ways or how you think about consumption not only of material goods but also cultural via social media which seems to be the only thing available to us during isolation and what does it mean to parcel out bits of yourself for our consumption right now by letting us peek into your private space oh that's a good question mm -hmm. Um, the first one about consumption, I think, you know, there's two aspects to that. And one of the things I was talking with Cecilia Dean about earlier today was that we kind of feel like this is nature's big fuck you to humanity. Like, I've warned you, you know, <laughs> I sent a couple hurricanes, mm -hmm. you're treating me really poorly. Like, I'm hiding these little time bombs all around the jungle for you guys to step on. You know, it's like, what we were doing is it's just unsustainable, not only in terms of sustainability, but it's just kind of vulgar the way we consume. And one of the reasons I'm not a super successful architect, I think, is that the design work we do tends to be very intricate and very difficult to build and would therefore be very expensive. And my reasoning behind that has always been that I've always wanted to do something which, you know, people wouldn't want to tear down or wouldn't want to have a half-life of 30 years. Or um, The other part of that is the social media aspect. I read somewhere that um, that people feed, uh, you know, walk like five miles on their phone every day, mm -hmm. just going down their feed. And I thought that was also kind of vulgar because I thought, what would you see if you walked around five miles on your legs? You know, and if you compare what you're, and there's a direct correlation between how much you feed yourself on your phone and your kind of mental health and happiness. And it's an inverse proportion. The more you walk on the phone, the less happy you, you tend to be. And I, I kind of feel like this is an opportunity for us to maybe do a little bit more of what I was talking about and just like be happy with the kind of things that you have, you know, a, a check on our unchecked consumption of things for more and more and more. I mean, it's actually pretty interesting with the exception of a little bit of food, like how little we can get by on. Like I haven't bought any new clothes in a month. I haven't bought any, I haven't, bought, I haven't gotten a haircut in a month. I haven't like bought anything other than, you know, like basic staples. I haven't bought, um, I haven't bought anything basically. And if you would have told me a month ago, like, you're going to not buy anything for the next month and it's not going to change your life at all. I would have been like, no way, that's impossible. My boyfriend and I see a uh, play in New York probably once or twice a week, just something we do. And that's gone away and still we're fine, you know? So in a sense, it's showing us how little it takes to maybe exist and that there's other ways we can spend our time and money. And as far as giving off away a little piece of myself, I don't know. I think architects do that all the time. I mean, I spent during the last recession in 2007 to 2013, uh, I spent five years working on someone's apartment who ju which just sold for $22 million. And when you dedicate so much of your life to someone else's apartment, like 
you're giving a lot of yourself to this other person, you know, and I'll never see that apartment again now that it's sold. So I think there's something, some aspect of architecture, which is inherently giving your most creative, like ideas and presence to people and places that you may never experience again in your life. It's a giving profession. Yeah, I mean, the, I think I've, I find the, the kind of relationship to consumption most, ex, most sort of affecting relation to food, like, like, like so much cooking, like, and so much like, oh my God, I'm not, I'm going to use like half an onion. I'm going to keep <laughs> the other half for this evening, you know, like, um, and like, it's, it's, so, it's such a weird feeling. Like it's, I don't know, like it's, it's, a, it's really weird, isn't it? Cause it's not like there aren't no, are no onions. There's loads of onions. Like, you know, if you go, if you, I mean, I, I actually haven't been to the supermarket, um, but like I imagine, or, you know, on my online orders, I can still order really exotic things. Like, but I'm sort of behaving as if, or I'm sort of self-rationing in a way which is completely different behavior. I mean, yeah. from the, you know, profligacy of using a whole onion in, um, in, a, in a pasta sauce, you know? Uh, I think, yeah, so I, I definitely feel like a different relationship to how we're consuming. Things. Well, if you consider like how the world changed, I was in New York during 9-11 and it wasn't just the event that was significant. It was how the architecture world and the world in general responded to it the 10 years that followed. And my guess is that this pandemic is going to prompt a big change in architecture and how we think about architecture and spaces and buildings and consumption. I'm just not sure what that effect is going to be, but you know, 9-11, I watched the whole thing, it lasted a day, but the impact of that on how we thought about the architecture of security and terrorism and the TSA and fortifying buildings, not that these are all great responses, but they completely changed the landscape of architecture in the same way that I'm sure this is going to do. I'm just, again, not sure how. Um, we have another question from Anna. Um, she said, what's up, Mark, given that you can't leave your house, given that you can't leave your houses, what are your thoughts on traveling with your house? AK, would you ever live in a mobile home, which would allow semi comfortable travel at no imprisonment? And or would you ever consider designing a sort of luxurious mobile home? <laughs> Well, I'm, you know, I would design anything if someone pays me to do it. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I love that I was just reading a magazine online a couple of days ago because we have time to do those things now. And it's like an outdoor magazine. I think I was just like desperate for some views of something pretty and non-urban. So I looked at this outdoor magazine and I saw these ads for Airstream. And Airstream is that company that makes those beautiful silver Tow, towing things that you pull behind your truck or whatever and they have a new design that's designed basically for millennials you know it's like the new generation of airstream it's just like the cutest little thing and i was thinking to myself like i want one of those you could just like drive out into the woods and park and exist i think that would be amazing but i wouldn't want to do it full time <laughs> and i'm not sure it would be so great in a quarantine because you can't really get out of it you know you can drive wherever you want, but you can't pop out and <laughs> walk around the block. And yeah, we're getting told no, no, well, no, like maybe it's probably the same for you guys, like no trips, which are not essential and definitely going to a national park, for example, that is not essential. We've yeah. got uh, police, we've got drones, police, you know, flying around national parks, telling people to get, get the hell out. Um, I mean, yeah, afterwards, yeah that's actually maybe a perfect response like mm. mobility for mobility forever yeah 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 mm -hmm. yeah my boyfriend and i were looking at uh vbro and airbnb we're like what's our plan you know when the zombies come out in new york city you know and this thing really goes south do we rent a house in like south carolina like <sighs> and we were literally looking on airbnb and vbro and like picking our escape houses 
<laughs> because the only, you know, like if things really go south, I have an ax, you know, other than that, like, yeah, I have like maybe a month's worth of canned food and an ax. I'm not going to make it that long. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you could put whatever you put, you can put different things into your spray gun. This is like true. Kind of this is true. Talents into yeah. <laughs> taking on zombies with a spray gun full of Lysol. There's a TV show. Um, we've also got a question. Let's see. Hold on. They're coming in. Uh, this one's actually from Dante. So he says, I'm curious about Sam's community center at the ground floor of his new house. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, as you know, um, uh, of, like real estate prices in London up until the last few weeks have been as insane or as, as New York City as almost every, uh, every city around the world. Um, so this idea of like building a house was ridiculous. But um, what uh, made it possible was the fact that the land is owned by a very small charity um, who do like kind of work in the very, that very, very, very local community. I like a few streets around that, um, that site. Um, and, but they're in a building on that site, which is falling down um, and kind of, you know, dangerous to occupy. So it's a, it's a, essentially it's a deal uh, between me and them that they put their land in and, I pay for the construction. So in a sense, it's a deal which we both feel like we're getting a, a, the, the good end of it because the land is so expensive that would make it would in, an impossible, uh, would, like crazily impossible project um, uh, for me to undertake uh, without that, uh, that their end of the deal. And as a small charity, like con you know, raising that much money was also out of the question for them. So it's a sort of like, um, a marriage of marriage of convenience um, that allows something to happen, them to stay in their their particular situation, working with the community they've worked with for two or three generations, and allows and allows me to have somewhere to live. At least that's the dream, um, and it's sort of yeah, kind of a way that evades, in some senses, the overly you know kind of the the, the way in which development steamrollers any quality of of kind of local life in um, the modern metropolis. So yeah, that's, that's why it's there. Yeah. Um, we also have another question from Paul S. He wants to know if either of you are particularly interested in Feng Shui or ancient Indian, I'm gonna butcher this next phrase, Vastu Shatra in your, in your homes. Not yet, but I think I could get into it <laughs> over the next few weeks. What I, I what I'm actually reading at the moment is um the lost the lost lost gods of uh of England, which is about the period in England like after the Druids, but before Christianity. So it's sort of like basically like Scandinavian Danish culture. So it's, it, and it's like trying to unearth the names and the rituals of these like ancient forgotten, forgotten gods. So I might start performing some weird um, fertility rites. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hadn't, you know, really looked into those methods of design, but I spent a lot of time, I think, like Sam, traveling around. And one of the reasons I do it is to just see how other cultures deal with space. So that was the reason I went to Tibet a couple of years ago. I went to um, North Korea for a week just to see like how their cities are laid out and how they deal with space. So, you know, I value uh, experience about architecture and design in space from different cultures, but I don't ascribe to any rule set that was produced by either my own culture or those cultures. So I don't like, you know, obey the five um, or the five, Le Corbusier's five things of modernism. What are they called? Not the police of modernism or something, yeah. you know, but, you know, Vitruvius's 10 books and Platio's four books and, 
you know, uh, or the systems of Feng Shui, these are all like design guidelines. And uh, I don't, I don't uh, ascribe to kind of any of them. Not that they're bad or good. They're just not what I, you know, not what I do. Um, we have a couple more questions and, and then we'll eventually pass it back to Dante to wrap things up. Um, we have another question from uh, R. Reyes. Does music have an imprint on the way you both design or is peace and quiet the way you both function? Um, you know, it says like me, sometimes I need heavy metal to force out an idea or sometimes John Coltrane to finesse a model. <laughs> you, do you listen to music while you work or is it, for me personally, it's, I have to have silence. I hate, I can't do both. I can't do music and draw. You know, it's interesting, uh, this may be embarrassing for me to admit, but I, anytime I'm designing or writing, I don't listen to music when I read, but when I'm writing, like I have wrote those last two books on aesthetics, probably listening exclusively to uh, The Clash, Alice in Chains and Soundgarden. <laughs> <laughs> Like my musical tastes like stopped developing when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. So I'm stuck in, in like uh, late, late eighties. I just bought tickets to go see Motley Crue, Def Leppard. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. seriously. But yeah, seriously. Um, they're doing some big stadium tour in August that I'm hoping isn't canceled. Yeah. But, uh, they're the headliners. But yeah, I, I, even when I'm writing, I have to be listening to like, heavy metal or punk and in my office it's all punk and very rarely at home I'll pop on something classical but I I can't design without music and I can't write without music yeah yeah I mean I I don't know Loud like, music. at some point like I don't know like I used to be such a big music fan and at some point I just like like I don't want to I don't want to make any choice about music I don't know what happened to me but I do need a lot of noise to distract me so I can concentrate yeah. so it, it would it would not be unusual to find me with the tv on with the radio simultaneously on and possibly something else on also like um and I would be really happy in that cacophony of of sounds um and I think what yeah, the, uh, the, what I like about that is that I find it really, if someone says to me, Sam, can you concentrate? Can you do this thing now? Like, I cannot. I find it entirely impossible. If I do like, you know, five different things at the same time, I find it so much easier. And I think it's the same if your eyes are on one thing, your ears are on another, your hands on another. I find that really comforting and um, like soothing <laughs> and takes me into a, a sort of, it takes me into the zone, you know? Yeah, I'm with you. I, I actually have in our kind of loose office policies, one of them is that if you're the first person into the office, you have to turn on the music. <laughs> I just like, I, 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 it, and there's, we have like serious music and there's like six approved stations that people are allowed to pick from. <laughs> They're all basically like punk and heavy metal. I'm sure they hate it, but. <laughs> All right, well, um... I don't think anyone's adding any additional questions to our chat. So uh, just wanted to say thank you first to Mark and Sam. This was really fun and super brightened up my day. <laughs> and yeah, thank too. you to everybody that joined. There was like at some point uh, like 150 participants. Yeah. So I uh, didn't, didn't realize we were going to get there, but yeah, that was yeah, great. You're all, you're all supposed to put in your credit card information for the thousand dollar donation to the speakers <laughs> on the way out. So when you click leave that, that'll come up. So Dante, um, I'll pass it back to you to kind of wrap up. Yeah. Um, can you guys all hear me? Am I, I'm good. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you um, to Madeline and dinner with designers. Thank you to Mark Foster Gage and to Sam Jacob. It was really a pleasure to have you guys. Uh, I mean, Normally we do this event in a space that literally holds like 15 people max in a Chinatown basement. So, you know, I guess if there's one silver lining, it's that uh, we can vastly increase the amount of people that get to enjoy uh, these events. And, 
you know, I think it was actually kind of nice, even though um, we've sometimes done this with three people, we had a nice kind of dialectical relationship here with you two, kind of exact opposites, as, <laughs> as was stated, you know, um, the no architecture versus all the architecture, and then some, um, you know, the separate office versus the combined. And, um, you know, we don't know what we'll be doing next month. Maybe we'll be hosting another event uh, online. So I would invite all of you guys to join us um, if you can. Um, and also, if you haven't already, go to naira.nyc and subscribe. And um, thank you so much. This was, this was really, really great. And I hope everyone has a, a great evening and stay safe and stay indoors. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Have a nice Bye. night. Bye. Good night, Sam. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Sam. Bye.